Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Briz Science, the University of Queensland's free science and technology lecture series, where we bring you not only the best scientists, but the best science communicators. My name is Leonie Small, and I will be your host for this evening. Um, I will, of course, be filling in for Dr. Joel Gilmore, our regular and beloved Briz Science host. Unfortunately, he was unable to be here tonight. And Dr. Gurian Ang, who often fills in when Joel is away, was also unavailable. So, you have me. <laughs> They're actually both in regional Queensland, different locations, mind you, both in regional Queensland working on science outreach projects of their own. So this is the problem when you work with such successful scientists. They have so many different projects on the go at once. Um, if you've been part of the Briz Science family for a while now, you may recognize me. Uh, usually, I'm the one who checked your ticket at the door. But uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm an engagement officer with the University of Queensland's Faculty of Science, and I've been managing Briz Science for about four years now. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to The Edge tonight, our long-term venue partner. Um, I would like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, to a few housekeeping items. Um, if this is your first Briz Science, welcome. Thank you so very much for coming. Um, it's going to be a great night. If I was channeling Joel right now, I might even say it's going to be explosive. Yeah, that's about as much laughter as he usually gets too, so <laughs> I'm gonna chalk that up as a win. Um, tonight we're going to have a presentation that is going to be followed by questions from you in the audience, and then we're going to invite you to meet us out in the lobby for some light refreshments. Uh, we ask questions uh, two ways here at Free Science. The first way is if you have your mobile device with you, please tweet us using the hashtag BrizScience. It will pop up on the screen later. There are two S's. Um, the other way, if you uh, picked up a question slip when you came in, a piece of paper with the Briz Science logo on it, we will get you to write your questions down on that piece of paper and wave it in the air at the end of the talk, and someone will come around to collect that. They'll bring it up to me, and we'll ask your questions from there. Um, finally, if you do have your phone with you tonight, I would just ask that you please switch it to silent. So, without any further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Teresa Abide is a petrologist and volcanologist with UQ School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. She has a passion for understanding how volcanic systems work and why, how, and when eruptions occur. For her volcano science innovation and science communication, she's been awarded Australian People's Choice at 180 Degrees of Science in 2016 and at Fresh Science in 2017. Tonight, she's going to talk to us about the tiny crystals which are formed deep within volcanoes and could prove to hold the key in predicting volcanic eruptions. So please join me in welcoming Teresa to the stage. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And thank you all very much for being here tonight. Imagine magma, molten rock, stored inside the earth, relatively stable, it seems. All of a sudden, something happens, and the magma comes up to the surface very quickly and generates a volcanic eruption. What happened? What made the magma rise to the surface? Why do volcanoes erupt? To answer this key question, which can help us better predict volcanic activity in the future, we need to understand how volcanoes work. 
And tonight, I'd like to talk to you about how volcano science is moving towards that goal and how this is something we're also doing as a contribution from UQ and from our team of international collaborators. Volcano prediction is becoming more and more important as the global population rises. Today, almost 10% of the people around the world live within 100 kilometers of an active volcano. And whereas volcanoes generate beautiful landscapes and can form fertile soils, they also pose major natural hazards. In the biggest recorded eruption in history, the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia had a death toll of 100,000 people. And only two months ago, Volcano Fuego, which is fire in Spanish, in Guatemala in South America, killed more than 100 people. These explosive eruptions generate hot clouds of gas and ash that not only cause travel on land, they also affect the air traffic. So you might remember in 2010, there was a big problem across Europe because the Icelandic, let's call it E-volcano, <laughs> erupted. And so there were major economic issues and major problems for weeks in Europe. And more recently, you might remember that we also had quite a bit of trouble with Mount Tagung on Bali. This was only in November last year, and who here has been to Bali? I've been to Bali. Yeah, quite a few of us. We don't want, we would not like to get our flights cancelled or delayed or get stranded at the airport. But this is something that can happen with explosive eruptions. And not only this, even more, explosive eruptions can even affect the climate. So major events like the 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines can decrease global temperatures, in this case, half a degree for two years. These are short-term climatic effects but they affect agriculture and crops. And so, as I said at the beginning, we need to understand how volcanoes work. We need to understand their personalities. And so today, I'd like to take us on a journey to understand how volcanoes erupt and why they're triggered. But perhaps be before we start on that journey, we should think about where they occur. The occurrence of volcanoes is not coincidental. The, it is strongly controlled by the geology. And so if we think about the Earth in terms of geology, we can think a bit of something like an onion. It has layers. And the outermost of these layers is not continuous. It's composed of smaller pieces which move, can move um, closer to each other or apart. These are what we call tectonic plates. And here today, at the edge, in brief science, in speaking in global terms, we are relatively close to one of those boundaries between tectonic plates where volcanoes typically occur. And that's all that yellow line which is reflecting what you might have heard about, the Pacific Ring of Fire. So what is happening in this plate boundary? So what happens is that the oceanic Pacific plate, which is denser and thinner, is going underneath the Australian plate, which is thicker and colder. And as the plate goes underneath um, the, the, uh, sorry, the Pacific plate goes underneath the Australian plate, it introduces water which makes it possible to melt the rocks down under our continent. 
And so when the magma is generated, this magma is less dense than the rocks that surround it, and so it can rise towards the surface, generating a ridge of volcanoes. And this is exactly what we found around the Pacific. So this happens when, um, when tectonic plates move towards each other. And when they move apart, they also generate volcanism. This is a reconstruction of the opening of the Atlantic Ocean from about 120 million years ago up until today. And you can see uh, South America on the left separating from Africa on the right-hand side. And as they do so, we get oceanic floor newly generated in between. And in the middle of that ocean, the red line represents volcanic activity. So when plates move apart, they also generate volcanoes. If we think about this red line of volcanic activities and we put it on this global um, map, it would represent the lighter blue line that we find in between the Americas and Africa and Europe. And the only reason why this line does not have lots of red triangles, which here represent active volcanoes at the moment, is because these volcanoes are under the water. And so, poor things, they're not considered volcanoes, strictly speaking. But what you can really see very nicely here is the horseshoe shape of the Pacific Ring of Fire. So we have volcanoes occurring where plates get together, volcanoes occurring where plates get apart, and also volcanoes in the middle of plates, in the middle of nowhere, geologically speaking. Can you recognize any? Correct. Can you see Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific? This is related to a hot spot anomaly deep in the mantle of the Earth. And so what's happening is that the Pacific plate is moving over a stationary hotspot and we get a line of volcanoes. So that's the other way of getting volcanoes as well. When we get, um, so we, the occurrence of volcanoes is strongly controlled by the geology and the type of volcano we get is also quite different. We're going to see some examples now. This is a 2010 eruption of the E volcano again in Iceland. And now we are seeing it from a helicopter rather than from a satellite image. And we can see how this explosive eruption generated a hot cloud of ash and gas, which is basically composed of fragmenting magma. As the magma comes up to the surface, it breaks into pieces, some of which we can see as they are falling in the air and getting aerodynamically shaped as they go down to the floor. These are called volcanic bombs. And in general, when the magma breaks into, piece and into pieces upon eruption, we call those pieces pyroclasts. So you do not get, do you not want to get close to any of those volcanic bombs because you might end up like one of the citizens of Pompeii in the ancient Rome era in the 79 year, where, which was quite affected by one of those. And if you may remember, this is a city which was completely covered by the very explosive eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which is located close to Naples in Italy. And so excavations in this site earlier this year recently discovered uh, this volcanic bomb and the unlucky um, citizen that was trying to escape from the eruption. But perhaps when we have explosive eruptions, one of the biggest hazards is the development of pyroclastic flows. And this is an example from Japan in 1991, where the dome collapsed and this massive pyroclastic flow was generated, which rushed down the valley very, very quickly. These things can travel as fast as an airplane. And they just basically destroy everything on the way. They are extremely destructive and hazardous. And so, most of the population had been evacuated at this time, but there were still journalists and scientists on the volcano reporting the eruption, and unfortunately, 43 of them died, including several famous volcanologists. 
And so when these massive pyroclastic flows come to rest, all the material they are bringing with them generates a massive deposit that we call a tuff. And you might have seen one of those around. So if you've come up by CityCat uh, tonight, maybe you've gone past the Kangaroo Point Cliffs, which are a massive tuff that was deposited 226 million years ago. So at that time, they didn't, this wouldn't have affected us, but maybe some early dinosaurs were not so happy about this back then. Next time you go to Kangaroo Point, make sure you have a look at the rocks. So all these explosive eruptions we're seeing look quite different, if you think about it, to the pictures we've been gathering lately from Hawaii, for example. So compared to all this explosivity, Hawaiian eruptions are relatively gentle. They cover the land, obviously, and they destroy whatever they come across, but the level of destruction is relatively minor by comparison. This is a video that is uh, running around the internet and my father sent it to me and it's just absolutely beautiful how you can see this eruption. It's just a, a show, a natural show. And you can see it quite from quite a close distance. You can see how this lava is very, very runny. The viscosity is very low. And it just generates these kind of rivers of lava which are absolutely beautiful. And as they get in contact with the air, which is cold, they cool down and generate this black rock that we call basalt. And this black rock may even generate like tubes of cold material. And these tubes allow the lava with inside them, which still is running, to, to travel for hundreds of kilometers. And in this case, it is reaching the sea and it is superheating the water as it does so. And so these beautiful lava flows are really less hazardous in terms of the effects they can have on us. And they are really, really nice to watch. And so basically, in summary, we have two main eruptive styles. We have explosive eruptions, which are very hazardous, and less hazardous effusive eruptions. The, formers, the former eruptions, the explosive ones, generate a big explosion, whereas the effusive ones generate nice lava flows that can round down the mountain. What's the difference? Why do some volcanoes typically generate explosive eruption? Others are typically effusive. It's all about the gas. It's about opening a bottle of well-shaken champagne or opening a bottle of red wine. And you can nicely pour the red wine on your glass. So what happens is that typically in explosive eruptions, we are dealing with very viscous, sticky magma. And this sticky magma does not allow the bubbles to escape. And so the pressure builds up more and more and more and more. And eventually, when the volcano erupts, it explodes. And by contrast, effusive eruptions are typically those with very runny, low viscosity magma. And so when this, uh, this magma allows the bubbles to get released, and so when it erupts, this magma just converts into nice lava flows. And the key point here is that many of the explosive eruptions on Earth occur very close to us in the Pacific Ring of Fire. But at the beginning of this talk, we were talking about why do they start? Why do these volcanoes get started? Why do they get triggered? And so to answer this question, we need to get inside the volcanoes. How are we going to do that? Well, Jules Verne envisioned this idea back in the 19th century. So a German professor and his nephew and a helper decided to go down inside the Earth through the S-volcano in Iceland. 
and you know, explore all the inside of the Earth and all the creatures and natural hazards they encountered. And then they happily came up through Stromboli again. Easy. So unfortunately, we can't do that still today. But we can use science to try to make the journey anyway. So let's start our journey inside the volcanoes. And let's try to see what kind of processes are taking place inside. You ready? OK. So the volcano we actually see on the surface is just the tip of the iceberg. The more we study volcanoes, the more we realize how complex they are inside and how they are actually fed by a very complicated network of magma chambers and reservoirs and tubes that bring magma to the surface. These are called magmatic plumbing systems. And actually what happens inside this magmatic plumbing system conditions the development of eruptions in the surface. Particularly, we know that a very efficient trigger of volcanic eruptions is the arrival of new melt, the arrival of new injections of magma into these deep reservoirs. Because the new magma is very hot and it brings in dissolved gases that can generate instability in the system and trigger, trigger it to erupt. So we are very interested in these kind of injections of magma at depth, and we can try to track them in several ways. When the magma comes in, it pushes the rocks apart, and that may generate earthquakes. So that's something we can monitor. We can also see if the volcano is inflating or deflating, and we can measure that with GPS and satellites. And we can also measure the gas that comes up from the crater. But when we get this data in an event of unrest, what do these data mean? We need to have some context. We need to understand the personality of that volcano to get to know what these data mean. And so how are we going to do that? We need to study something that has been down there and now somehow has reached us here at the surface. And I'm talking about my little heroes, the volcanic crystals that form inside the volcano are, are transported to the surface by de erupting magma. So these crystals grow from the center to the rim, like the rings of trees. And as they grow, they record a history of processes taking place in the environment. And so, for example, in this hypothetical cartoon where we have a magma reservoir with a gray magma, we would be generating a crystal with a gray composition. Whereas an, if a new magma comes in, and this one is hotter and is red in composition, then we generate a rim that is red in composition as well. So then the trick is to try to find this crystal, these heroes, and try to crack the code, try to understand the, the secrets they're holding for us. And for this, we use a number of techniques. So the first thing we do is we go to the field, we collect samples, and we bring them back to the lab. And we study them with a number of techniques, starting with the microscope and getting a bit more complicated as we need more information. And so for decades, these crystals have been studied with traditional techniques that have already given a lot of information. But something that is quite new today is that we have developed some laser technology that allows us to extract new secrets from the crystals. So I'm going to explain this laser technology with an example. Please meet the little pyroxene. The little pyroxene, please meet the audience. It's very small. That's a scale bar, half a millimeter. It's as small as a grain of salt, more or less. And it's a crystal of a mineral called pyroxene, which is quite frequent in basalts, for example, from Hawaii. And this crystal I studied for my PhD, and then I took with me to Ireland, and then I took with me here. It's just come all the way through with me, and I'm really attached to it, so I named it. 
And I always use it for demonstrating how the laser technique works. So, what do we do if we want to get information from this crystal with the laser? What we do is we use a laser similar to the one used for eye surgery to remove a thin layer of material from the sample. So we generate a line and then we repeat the line down so that we are able to sample the whole crystal. We remove material from the whole crystal and as we are removing this material, we transport it into an instrument that gives us chemical composition. And we call this a mass spectrometer. And basically what it does is that it separates chemical elements depending on their mass. And because we have removed material with the laser from all this area, we can build an image of the composition of all that area. And the image looks a bit like this for chromium. Chromium is an interesting element because it's very abundant in those fresh injections of magma coming into the system. And you can see that the little pyroxene has a core with relatively low contents in chromium, blue colors, cold colors. But then it also has a rim with warmer colors that have higher contents in chromium. And so if this element is representing the arrival of new melt into the system, this means that this eruption was probably triggered by this new magma coming in and bringing all the magma up to the surface. So this means that we can use these maps to pinpoint the trigger of the eruption. And look at the scale on the right-hand side. This scale goes to only 1,000 ppm, which means 1,000 parts per million, which is about 0.1%. So that's really little. If it's 300 people here tonight, 0.1% is the head and shoulders of one of us. But we are able to resolve this little spike with our technique. And this means that we can pinpoint the trigger of eruption. And so we decided to apply this technique to active volcanoes around the world. And we started with a very special one. This is Mount Etna in Sicily, in Italy one of the most active volcanoes on Earth and the most active in Europe. You can see in this NASA time lapse from the 1990s how the volcano is inflating and deflating several times by a few centimeters only as it gets new magma from depth and then it erupts the magma to the surface. It's like breathing. It's an extremely active system. And it is extremely well monitored. We have a lot of data of earthquakes and gases that we can compare to the data from our crystals. And interestingly, this volcano has not always been this active. It has been particularly active in the last 40 years. And this had been hypothesized to be related to the arrival of new magma into the system. So we thought, let's go and have a look and see if we can find some crystals to test this hypothesis. So it wasn't a hard uh, trip. Mount Etna is very nice. It's uh, by the Mediterranean Sea, which you can see at the bottom there. And it's just a spectacular place to be in. So these are colleagues from Trinity College Dublin in Ireland on the flank of the volcano on top of a solidified lava flow. And you can see a little cone in the distance and also the, the Mediterranean Sea on the left-hand side of the image. So we went to Etna and we collected observations and we collected samples and we even went into lava tubes. So you remember when I was talking about Hawaii before and I was explaining how the lava gets cold on the top and generates a crust through which the lava can run inside. When the eruption ends, if all the magma, all the lava is evacuated, we can generate a tube like that and then we can visit it as a cave. So we collected plenty of rocks and you might think, well, that looks like a black rock to me. Fair enough. This is one of them, a piece of basalt. And you know, you may think, well, that's quite an interest in a piece of black rock. But trust me, it is interesting. 
Um, when we look at these rocks under the microscope, and to do that we need to prepare very thin slices of rock, as thin as possible so that the light can go through them and we can look at them under the microscope, those rocks look like that. You see all these brown bits? Those are crystals of pyroxene, the mineral I was talking about before. And so we can have a look at these crystals and see what stories they're bringing from depth, from inside the volcano, about its personality. Let's have a look. So this is one of those pyroxene crystals under the microscope. And so we decided to do a map using the laser on that area which is marked with a white square. The dashed white line simply represents the outline of the crystal for reference. So what happened for chromium? That's what happened. We have a core of the crystal which is low in chromium, but again a massive spike at the rim, which tells us that the new magma was triggering this eruption. So we can pinpoint the trigger of this and all the other eruptions we studied across 40 years of eruptive activity. But not only that, we also realized that these rims that are reaching chromium were of consistent thickness. The thickness was always the same over 40 years of eruptive activity. And so this means that if we know the rate at which the crystals grow, we can estimate how much those rims, those rims sorry, took to grow. And so we can estimate how much time elapsed since the arrival of magma at depth until the eruption commenced. And that was around two weeks for about 40 years, which is extremely interesting because it gives us a time window to react. When we compare those two weeks that we obtained from the crystals to the data we get from earthquakes, we realize that for some of the key eruptions that we were studying, we have a pattern of earthquakes starting at around two weeks before the eruption started. And so this is basically telling us that when the new magma comes in, it pushes rocks apart, that generates earthquakes, and from that moment on until we get the eruption, we have two weeks to react. So basically, we can use these crystals a bit like crystal balls. Except we are not actually looking into the future, but rather we're looking into the past and using the past to provide a context with which to understand future signs of unrest. And this is very important in a volcano like Mount Etna, which is extremely active. And not only that, we can use the composition of those rims to try to understand the depth at which they formed. And we found that they form up at about 10 kilometers, which means that the new magma coming from depth is recycling cores, it's forming those rims at about 10 kilometers, and it's generating an eruption in two weeks' time. Being such an extremely active volcano, this is a picture that a friend sent us in 2015, shortly before uh, Christmas time. It is one that we need to have well constrained. And this was also demonstrated quite recently, last year, when a BBC crew that was um, taking some footage from the volcano had to literally round down the mountain when the volcano started exploding, and so some tabloids made a bit of a, a big claim on this, but it is true that these journalists, for example, had to get a new coat. <laughs> the big important thing of this as well is that Mount Etna is located really close to the city of Catania, which today hosts 300,000 people. And so one of the eruptions we are now very interested in is the largest eruption that this volcano had in recorded history. And one of the students in the team is looking at that at the moment. He's sitting there. <laughs> so this eruption in the 17th century 
generated explosions through the summit craters, but it also generated a smaller cone on the flank of the volcano. And the lavas coming out of this cone were able to reach the part of the city of Catania at that time. So we are very interested in understanding what kind of processes were producing the development of this eruption, which because it was really, really big. And so one of the things this eruption erupted was not only lavas, but also some crystals. And these ones are actually quite big. I have some of them here, so you can have a look later. I'll hold one now. So this is big for us. <laughs> About a centimeter. They are so big for us compared to the grain of salt we saw before that we call them mega crystals. They're really big for us. And so they can potentially hold a really large record and really lar large amount of information on the processes that happen prior to eruption. So what we do is we look at them first under the microscope. And this is one of them um, on the image there. And you may argue, well, that looks a bit gray. That's true. But the white rectangle there represents the area that we targeted for laser analysis. And what did we get? Let's have a look at chromium again. That's pretty colorful. So we have an amazing zonation pattern of chromium in these large crystals with the core region, then several oscillations, which apparently did not trigger eruption and a final rim, which is extremely rich in chromium, and did trigger the eruption. Now, if you think about it, extremely rich in chromium, oh well, we are up to 200 parts per million there. Remember, we were up to 1,000 before. So actually, this massive eruption seems to have been triggered by the arrival of magma that is not so dissimilar in composition to what was there before. And so we are, at the moment, really, really interested in these kind of cryptic processes that we can see in crystals. And because the crystals are so big, not only are we are doing laser mapping of them, we are also doing something quite interesting in collaboration with colleagues in the US. We are putting these crystals under, C under a CT scanner. So similar to the ones they use in hospitals to scan brains, for example, we can actually get into the crystal and start seeing little sparkles of other things. And those other things are other minerals that are engulfed by this big megacrist as this one was being formed. And those little sparkles, those little crystals, are of a mineral called magnetite, and they hold a record by themselves. And if I fast forward a little bit here, you might see that at some point, here, we start to see at the bottom pockets of magma. Of course, the magma here is converted into glass. It's quenched, and so it's not magma anymore. But we can actually see pockets of melt pockets of magma that were trapped as the crystal was growing. So this is a further record of um, pre-eruptive history that we are exploring at the moment. And this is extremely interesting because we can also build 3D models of the distribution of the different inclusions we find in these megacrysts. And so this is an example of those for that particular crystal where the different colors represent different minerals included in the bigger one as the bigger one grows. And so this is a very good amount and very good quality of information to interpret the dynamics of deep magma reservoirs, which are actually really complicated. Some colleagues from the US and France have developed mathematical models that try to reproduce what happens when the new magma gets injected into these deep reservoirs. Let me show you what you find here. In this model, the blue part at the top is the resident magma in the reservoir. 
and the white and black parts at the bottom are layers of crystals, and they're just with different colors for visualization purposes, but they are exactly the same crystals. And so what's coming from underneath the red blob is the new magma coming in. And you can see how when the new magma comes in, it recycles crystals which follow very complex and chaotic trajectories until this new magma meets the original one, the blue resident magma, and they also mix together. And so this whole complex is, his, this whole process, sorry, is extremely complex and takes place in what these researchers call the mixing bowl. And so we need this kind of studies on complex crystal kind of forensics to try to understand what actually happens at depth. And this kind of crystal forensics can be really handy for volcanoes where we do not have historical records, for example. You might remember that in Papua New Guinea earlier this year, we had the eruption of Kadova volcano. And this was the first in recorded history. So for the cases where we do not have previous records, having this kind of detective work on past volcanic rocks is extremely handy to understand those personalities, how those volcanoes work, what are the inner behaviors. And so, you know, in this journey inside the volcano, we've been looking at these kind of events of new arrival of magma at depth. And we've been looking at crystals, but it's also interesting to look at maybe additional approaches. So if we look at volcanic systems that are not active at the moment, but instead are very ancient, very old, we might have that part of the volcanic system has been eroded away over millions of years, and therefore we can get access to the guts of the volcanic system in situ, if everything else has, if everything else has been eroded away. And that's exactly what happens in certain places, like for example, really close to us in Mount Isa. So you might have been walking around the outback without realizing that some of those blocks are actually frozen or fossilized magma chambers, where we can see in situ the process of arrival of fresh magma, which they represent the pieces of black rock, breaking and fragmenting as they interact with the resident magma, which is the white rock there. So in these kind of very, very old rocks, and these ones are 1,600 million years old, where everything has been eroded away on top, we can access the magma chamber and see the processes that were taking place there, the mixing processes in situ. We can even see how crystals from one magma get transported into the other. And as they do so, they are unhappy in the new magma and they might generate coronas of different minerals around them. And these pictures were taken only last month when we were out in the outback with students uh, from the undergraduate degree. And if we go farther, um, closer to us in time, we might also look at volcanic systems that are also old, but maybe not as much. So the ones that have only a little bit of erosion, so we can get to see the subvolcanic system, the shallower portion of the magmatic plumbing system. And so, for example, you might have not realized that that's exactly what you see at the Glasshouse Mountains. So the original surface of the land would be more or less where the dashed line is. And so what you can do next time you go hiking there is have a look at the rocks and see if you can recognize any of those processes having ha taking place in the shallow plumbing system. 
these ones are actually very interesting, the glasshouse mountains, because they were active at about 30 million years ago, which is quite a bit. Um, and they belong to a bigger family. This is a map of Eastern Australia, and the blue star there represents the location of the Glasshouse Mountains, 34 to 25 million years old, a bit north from us. And you might have also been hiking in the Spring Springbrook National Park or the Lamington National Park, where we have the Tweed Volcano, which was active 24 to 20 million years ago. And so you might start to see in this map some sort of trend. There are blue pockets from the north. There are some of them are marked there, like Springshire, all the way to the south. And as we move from north to south, the rocks, the volcanic rocks, become younger. They are in a track that is progressing in age from north to south. And this is because they represent the movement of the Australian continent over a stationary hotspot, a little bit like what happens in Hawaii, but just next to us. And so this started about 30 million years ago, and the last, the youngest volcanoes associated with this track are about 5 million years old in southeastern Australia. And the hotspot today is believed to be located around Tasmania, although it's a bit quiet at the moment. But it's really spectacular how these volcanoes track the motion of Australia, in addition to giving us information on the way these volcanoes behaved a few million years ago. And actually, two of the members of the team today are working on this uh, volcanism uh, at the moment in different projects. And you know, as we are coming out of the volcano on our journey back to the surface, as Jules Verne envisioned, we might think about active volcanoes nowadays. And we, can, we don't have to go far. If we just go to the northern um, island on New Zealand, you can have access to a beautiful landscape of active volcanism. And the volcanoes in New Zealand were extremely, or have been extremely, extremely explosive and really interesting to study. And we also have a student working on those at the moment. And so, so far, we've been investigating the insides of volcanoes to try to understand why they erupt, always considering their inner personalities. But sometimes we have external forces driving volcanism. And for example, we might have meteorites hitting the Earth. And this is not very common today, thankfully. But it was quite common in the early Earth. And so when a meteorite hits a solid planetary body like the Earth, what happens is a little bit like when a drop of water falls into a pond, but just at a much, much bigger scale, of course. So what we get is a crater, we get a hole, and if the impact is big enough, we can melt the rocks that we are hitting. And not only that, the Earth tends to rebound after the impact, and when it does so, the rocks that are at depth may melt, and that magma may generate volcanism as well. And so this is a process that has been debated in the scientific community, and we wanted to investigate this. This is when I was back in Dublin. And so there are a number of impact craters on Earth, and this is an example uh, in Canada. And so we targeted the second biggest, the second biggest one, which is Sudbury in Canada. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to find evidence of volcanism post-dating the impact. So we went there for a couple of weeks, uh, survived the bears and the mosquitoes, which are even worse, and got lots of samples to study in the lab and under the microscope and found little pieces, fragments of 
volcanic glass, like the one in the image there, where we could even see the bubbles that were in the magma at the time of eruption when the magma was fragmenting. So we actually found evidence of volcanism after the impact, suggesting that the impact generated melting of deep rocks and volcanism for millions of years after the event. And in all these cases, what we're seeing is that we can use the rocks and the mineral that they contain as carriers of information of how the earth and volcanoes work inside. And so basically, volcano science can tell us a lot about why, where, and when volcanoes erupt and eruptions start. And I hope you enjoyed the journey, and the journey is to be continued. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll let you take a quick break and have a drink. Uh, now is the time to start tweeting me your questions. Don't forget to use the hashtag BrizScience. Otherwise, if you have your pen and paper with you, uh, when you finish with a question, if you do just hold it in the air, my colleague Elle will be around in a moment to collect those questions from you. While you're doing that, let me tell you what we have coming up next month. In September, we're going to be delving into the latest innovations in stroke research. In Australia, nearly 50,000 people suffer a stroke each year, and there are around 470,000 stroke survivors in Australia at the moment. A third of them are under the age of 65, so this is obviously an area where we need to be doing a lot of work. Um, Dr. Lavinia Codd is a stroke survivor herself, and she now works at the Queensland Brain Institute. She's going to be coming in to discuss her work on improving cognitive recovery following stroke by activating precursor cells in order to increase the production of new brain cells, which I'm really looking forward to hearing more about. It sounds absolutely fascinating. So if you haven't already, I would recommend that you jump on the Briz Science website and join our mailing list. That is the best way to hear about our upcoming talks and make sure that you get your tickets straight away. I do know these sell out quite quickly, so sometimes if you're not on the mailing list, you do miss out. So, Teresa, are you ready for some questions? Let's see what we've got on, thank you. Let's see what we've got on Twitter. Thank you. So. Thank you. We have one here asking about what actually prompts the refilling of the magma in the first place. So what's causing that magma generation at, at the sort of basis level? Yeah, great question. So the very beginning of the story is the generation of magma in the mantle. And so to do so, we need an appropriate geological setting. And so we can do this, for example, in subduction zones where tectonic plates move to, uh, towards each other, as I explained at the beginning, or when tectonic plates move apart from each other. And we can also do it in the middle of uh, plates when we have a hot spot, a heat anomaly in the mantle. And so when the mantle melts, it generates a magma that tends to rise to the surface. And it kind of gets, you know, the journey from the mantle, which can be depending, but around 30 kilometers underneath our feet to the surface, it, it's quite complicated. And so the magma gets stuck on the way and it kind of stagnates in these magma chambers and goes up again into tubes. And so often what we're looking at um, eruption trigger, triggering, typically we're looking at uh, magma chambers that, that do, are not necessarily very deep, but they are continuously getting fed by far the magma coming from partial melting of that mantle. So we need, of course, the initial ge uh, generation of magma to start with. Then the magma gets stuck on the way. 
and then eventually makes its way up to the surface. But the point is that when it gets stagnant and it cools, it might become unmovable unless new fresh magma is generated at depth and then it uh, pushes the system up to the surface. Actually, the majority of magmas generated on Earth do not erupt. It's actually a quite complicated journey all the way to the surface. So, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Brilliant. Then we had a few questions on a similar theme, uh, mostly asking what was the significance of the chromium in particular so why did, you, why did you focus your research on that particular, and are there any other heavy metals of sort of interest or significance? Yeah, fantastic question again. So um, I was showing chromium as an example, because it's really quite visual, because the, con the changes in the elements are very, very contrasted. But of course, the changes in chromium couple with other elements. So the elements that are also quite abundant in fresh injections of hot new magma would always be enriched on those rims. And by contrast, the elements that are quite not so abundant in those new magmas are depleted on those rims. So I only showed chromium for simplicity for the purpose of this talk. But of course, we look at a whole range of elements metals and other type of elements that can give us different information on, on pre-eruptive histories. Thank you. Uh, again, we have a couple of questions on a similar, similar theme, and they're around the, your sort of maps of the chambers. So how are you determining, without having been inside them, how are you determining them? And we have one on Twitter as well saying, uh, similar vein, how do you know that Mount Isa was at the lower part of a magma chamber at some point? Okay, so the first part was? Um, how are you determining ah, your the map, shapes? your map? Yes, so the cartoons we draw of how the volcanoes look inside are based on our data, so we do our best. So of course we haven't been there to check, but we know uh, from seismic tomography, for example, that there are pockets of melt underneath active volcanoes. So we do know that the magma is um, distributed into little pockets. So that's something we know. And, so, and from looking at our little heroes, the crystals, we know where those pockets are located and how they might be interconnected. And so this is how we, drew, we draw this cartoon. So we make them as accurate as possible with the data we have, but we cannot be sure that they are a perfect uh, description of the inside of the volcano. But yeah, the more, so for example, a good example is in the past, uh, old textbooks tend to draw a volcano with a massive blob of magma underneath it, the big magma chamber. And so we've, in the last decades, research has shown that this is not possible, actually, that we, what we have are little pockets interconnected with more tubes, and the way they are interconnected together um, controls the architecture of that plumbing system and how it works. And in terms of Mount Isa, um, we know that, well, we think actually that, that uh, those outcrops or those pictures there represent perhaps the upper part of a, of a magma reservoir. But we're actually not sure because we have not done research on those th ourselves, or not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great question. It's not easy to um, answer. To be able to, to determine that we would have to do more work, more field work to start with, and then more microscopy and chemistry on the, on the rocks to, be, to locate them in the crust. What we do know is the age, because all the researchers have dated them, and they are around 1,600 million years old. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. Uh, what do we have in place to help monitor when the new magma is coming through? So obviously the crystals are very important and we're able to see when that has happened in the past, how that co correlates to what's happening now. You did mention in your uh, presentation that there, are, there were earthquakes before the eruption at Mount Edna, but what, if anything, do we have in place at the moment that's helping to monitor what's happening below the surface, or is that still kind of like a tricky point? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, 
Mount Etna, for example, is a very well monitored volcano, and so there are lots of seismometers located in different places around the volcano, and so the um, seismic station that monitors this volcano has all the data in real time. And this is the best source of information in terms of real-time data. And this is also uh, complemented with deformation data, with satellites that measure the inflation and deflation of volcanoes, and also the gases. The gases that come out from craters are really a really good, uh, valuable information from what's going on inside. And so our approach, perhaps, so those are the real-time monitoring data, and so what we try to do is to give context to better interpret those data in, the, in terms of are these kind of uh, rumblings going to likely become an eruption or not? What happened in the past when similar uh, processes were detected? Did we have an eruption? What kind of things can we see from, from the rocks and the minerals they contain that uh, tell us about the personality of that volcano in particular and what those Rumbles might mean. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> ominous there. Um, we have a question here. How hard is it for you to find uh, the correct sort of rock samples that you need to find the crystals from the right depths? Is it sort of like a, a needle in a needle stack or is it they're just everywhere? Uh, it depends on the eruption. It depends on the volcano. Sometimes we are luckier than others. Uh, some t so, yeah, when we go in the field, we obviously do groundwork to look for... The first thing we look for are fresh rocks, because obviously these rocks being in contact with the air get altered very, very quickly. And so we want to get fresh um, and altered samples that we can actually measure. So we use our hammers to, to cut fresh pieces that we can use. And then the other thing is trying to find the ones that are going to be most interesting for our research. And so some um, volcanoes are relatively easy in terms of they're quite crystal rich, or the eruptions are less rich, so we just have to look a bit harder. But uh, it's not super difficult if you know what you're looking for. I have a follow-up question. This is just mine. Is it easier to find the crystals that you want from the explosive eruptions, or can you still find them in the sort of very beautiful, sort of liquid-style volcanoes? Yeah, you might find the uh, crystals in both. What is going to happen is that probably, if the explosive one is um, from a magma which is more viscous and has a different composition, the minerals you will find are probably going to be different. So those pyroxenes we were looking at are typical of what we call basaltic eruptions, like the one we have on the, on the desk or the Hawaiian ones. Uh, when we have very, very sticky magma, we will not find pyroxenes, but we will find all the minerals, for example, plagioclase, that can hold also records that we can interpret. And we'll end on a fun one. I have a question here. How close have you actually been to an erupting volcano? How close have I been? Yeah. So the closest I've been is about 50 meters at Stromboli. And it was one of the most special moments <laughs> in my life. <laughs> 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 it was really, really special. It was this picture. I'll show you. You've seen it with the publicity. Oh, no, it's not working. No, it's ah, it's coming up. So that was on the 9th of June of 2016, and this was really, really special. It was very, very spectacular, particularly the noise. So Stromboli is extremely active. It erupts every 10, 15 minutes, but the, explosion, the eruptions are not particularly explosive. They are mild, so that's why you, are, you can be there. And so the noise when the magma is coming out to the surface and it's just so exciting and then <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually it erupts. It's really, really it was really special. And but most of the time what we do is we say, okay, we're gonna study this eruption from this volcano and we go when everything's quiet. <laughs> in our case, other people take the risk and, and go in, in in difficult times. Yeah. But it's really special. Try to do it. It's cool. And that's our advice for tonight. But that please is be safe, be safe. <laughs> <laughs> Always be safe. That is all uh, that we have time for this evening. Please join me in thanking Teresa for her presentation. Thank you.
If your, if your question didn't get uh, make it to the cut tonight, I apologize. We did have quite a few. Um, Teresa will be available for questions uh, out with the refreshments, so please join us in the lobby. And we will see you next month. Thank you so much.